Hello, my name is Dr. Art Rastenhat, and today I'll be reviewing common pitfalls in prostate MRI. This has been a collaborative effort with my two colleagues and friends, Dr. Villani and Dr. Ben Levy. We have worked on this for over four years, and this is a compilation of the pitfalls that we have encountered throughout our experience with prostate MRI at 3T with an endorectal coil. Before we begin, we always have some disclaimers. This course is for educational purposes only. It allows our physicians to review the material after attending one of our hands-on courses. It is not to be used to direct patient care or a substitute for actual hands-on training. There are several diagnostic pitfalls associated with multiparametric MRI of the prostate. First, prostate MRI is a complex exam with multiple sequences, and each sequence is susceptible to its own unique artifacts. Once you're past the type of sequences and the artifacts, prostatic anatomy is complex, variable, and it's almost like a man's fingerprint. It's unique unto himself. You can confuse normal structures and benign conditions with malignancies. One is able to overcome these with experience and patience. The anatomy of the prostate is grouped into three regions. First, the peripheral zone, where 70% of the prostate cancers are found. The second is the central gland, which is a combination of the transition zone, central zone, and periurethral glands. And finally, the anterior thyromuscular stroma. This is an area that needs to be evaluated for malignancy as well as included when you perform prostate segmentation for MR ultrasound fusion guided biopsies. If this area is not included, your segmentation and fusion will not line up between the ultrasound and the MRI. As you become older, the central gland undergoes stromal and glandular hyperplasia, and these are where men develop symptoms for BPH. The typical appearance of cancer on multiparametric MRI is outlined by the yellow arrows as seen here. First, the T2 sequence. It was a low signal intensity on T2 imaging. The ADC map has a low signal on ADC map as seen here. And post contrast or dynamic contrast enhanced MRI was early arterial enhancement, which is shown here in the arrow using color map. There are many benign findings that can mimic cancer. We'll cover most of these in the upcoming talk. Prostatitis and inflammation, post biopsy hemorrhage, that's why we wait at least six to eight weeks after a prostate biopsy to obtain a prostate MRI, the endorectal coil and or metallic artifacts, confusing central gland nodules, exophytic hyperplastic central gland nodules in the peripheral zone, fibrous connective tissue can mimic malignancy, you have thick versus thin fibromuscular bands, evaluating the anterior fibromuscular stroma, and atypical lesions. As mentioned before, prostatitis and inflammation. These three images almost look identical to the ones I showed you earlier, denoting what a malignancy was on a multiparametric MRI imaging. Again, you have the low signal on T2, the low signal on ADC, and early arterial enhancement. This area was actually biopsied and found to be granulomatous prostatitis. In summary, prostatitis can exist as a focal lesion, similar to malignancy. It's really important that you have the clinical history when evaluating these lesions. If there's a question with infection, treat and re-image at a later date, usually approximately three months after the initial scan. This is another example of prostatitis showing T2 with a low signal and low ADC value, similar to malignancy. This patient was actually treated with antibiotics and subsequent imaging showed resolution of these findings. Post-biopsy hemorrhage can cause artifacts on prostate imaging. Sometimes the scenario exists when a patient has low-grade, low-volume disease on tra standard transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, a prostate MRI is obtained. Notice that in this patient, there's a low signal intensity on the left peripheral zone, consistent with a malignancy. However, when you look at the T1 imaging, there's a degree of hemorrhage present. However, it is actually bilateral but the right side peripheral zone is not causing as much as a signal distur disturbance in the other two sequences. However, following this patient up several months later, notice how the T2 imaging, the signal intensity has changed and it's returned back to normal. That is why we recommend six to eight weeks, at least a minimum amount of time to allow for 
hemorrhage to resolve after a standard transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. 3T MRI with endoreptical yields unparalleled images of the prostate gland aiding the detection of cancer. However, the coil can contribute to numerous artifacts that can limit one's exam's effectiveness. As seen here, notice in the right peripheral zone, there's an area of low signal, restriction on ADC, and post contrast, there's early arterial enhancement. This was a suspicious focus. However, a target biopsy revealed normal prostate tissue. The abnormal findings were later attributed to the asymmetric compression of the prostate gland by the endorectal coil. As seen here on a T2 weighted image, there's an endorectal coil MRI. Notice the uneven compression of the right peripheral zone greater than the left. This results in a focal low signal at the area of compression with associated low ADC values and early arterial enhance, enhancement mimicking malignancy. At biopsy, this is normal. Repeating the MRI with a coil in better position showed a complete resolution of the abnormalities. Please notice these two prostate MRIs, both with an endorectal coil, both in the same patient. Notice the first, the image on your left. There's a signal defect created by the abnormal rotation of the endorectal coil. Once the coil was repositioned, the artifact completely resolved and you have a normal prostate MRI. It's important to have a relationship with the MR technologist who places the endorectal coil that they know to check and to confirm proper probe placement. These are some examples of motion or pulsations associated with the endorectal coil that can limit the prostate exam. On the right, notice that there's no pulsations, and this can be accomplished by proper or optimal coil position, administering antispasmodic agents, and counseling the patient on relaxation and understanding what's going on during the exam can improve the quality of the images obtained. Metallic artifacts can distort diffusion-weighted imaging and the subsequent ADC maps. Observe the T2 image. It's of acceptable quality, and there's a left peripheral zone low signal lesion seen here. However, when looking at the ADC map, notice how the endorectal coil has been distorted this is your first clue that there's some metallic artifacts or a hip replacement possibly distorting the ADC maps. You're still possibly able to make out that there is a low signal area within the peripheral zone corresponding with the T2 findings on the, on the left. This is a wide field post contrast T1 weighted imaging showing bilateral hip prostheses causing the susceptibility artifact indicated by the yellow arrows. This affects the diffusion and ADC map sequences most severely as seen on the previous slide. Evaluating the central gland can be confusing and perplexing at times. I have a comparison here between the left and the right screens. On the left, there's numerous central gland hypertrophic nodules with cystic components, mixed signal, low signals, all have a thin low signal T2 peripheral band surrounding these lesions. These are all typically benign. However, notice this central gland nodule with a low signal with a charcoal-like appearance. It lacks that thin low signal band as seen in benign nodules. And we biopsy this area. It's found to be Gleason 3 plus 4 prostate cancer. Please take a moment to appreciate the difference between the two images. Hyperplastic or BPH nodules can occur within the peripheral zone. As seen here, the T2 with ADC and the DC color map. Notice there's an area of low signal within the left peripheral zone at the level of the apex. Notice the AADC low signal as well as the early arterial enhancement on the DCE. It's important to scroll up and down and understand that this left peripheral zone hyperplastic nodule was extending from the central gland into the peripheral zone. Notice that there's a thin dark band surrounding the gland. This was biopsy and found to be benign. This is a zoomed in view of the T2 weighted images shown on the prior screen. Notice there's a thin dark T2 band surrounding the peripheral zone lesion. This is indicative of a BPH nodule. Also, there's areas of high signal within the lesion. This is also consistent with BPH nodules within the peripheral zone. This is another example of a hyperplastic transitional zone nodule in the peripheral zone. 
This has several small cystive foci with a thin dark T2 band. This is consistent with a BPH nodule extending in the peripheral zone. This sometimes has been observed in patients undergoing prior transurethral sections of their prostate. In contrast, the majority of peripheral zone malignancies do not demonstrate a thin dark band or internal cystic foci. Several hyperplastic nodules in the peripheral zone on TT weighted imaging. I think it's important to observe these because it took us a long time to understand that these are benign findings. We continued to biopsy these till we really had a good grasp of what we were doing. So if you were starting a program, it's important that you evaluate these and determine them by biopsy to understand what your threshold is. Sometimes volume averaging can fool you to show you that there's actually a malignancy adjacent to the BPH nodule. So just don't discount these, but it's important to understand of this phenomenon. Prostatic fibromuscular and connective tissue pitfalls when evaluating prostate MRI. Take a look to evaluate the T2 weighted images that have been presented for you. On the right, there's bands that are thick and could represent malignancy that are enhancing and restricted. This was biopsy, it was actually Gleason 3 plus 4 disease. However, on the right screen, notice these thin, low signal bands that are often seen within the prostate peripheral zone and represent fiber muscle components, and these are benign. Take a moment to look at the difference between the two T2 weighted sequences. Connective tissue of the prostate can mimic malignancy. Sit with similar findings, T2, ADC, and enhancement characteristics of malignancy. However, the apparent lesion above is nothing more than fiber muscular bands between the prostate and the seminal vesicles. Careful observation will reveal these to be normal and symmetrical in nature. We colloquially refer to this as the rabbit ear sign. Notice there's bilateral paired low signal T2 foci in the peripheral zone and are seen on both the axial and coronal imaging. This is normal contacted tissue, not to be confused with an abnormality. Frequently, these structures are not completely symmetrical, as one in the previous slide was shown. It may confuse the reader into thinking these are lesions. Low signal T2 focus at the midline of the peripheral zone with low value on ADC suggests a lesion. However, this represents a normal connected tissue extending from the central zone to the base of the bladder. The coronal T2 plane of the same patient shows this to be a midline structure extending to the base of the bladder bilaterally, not to be confused with malignancy. The anterior fibromuscular stroma is a very important region of the prostate to evaluate. The typical appearance is low signal on T2 and low signal on ADC, which, as I've explained to you earlier, could be signs of malignancy. However, the anterior fibromuscular stroma should not have any early arterial enhancement. Sometimes it has mild enhancement. However, this should raise your suspicion for malignancy. Notice on the left, there's no distortion of the gland. However, on the right, this shows an abnormality of the anterior fibromuscular stroma displacing the central gland. One other important point is to include this in the segmentation for targeting for your MRI. Your MR segmentation should include the anterior fibromuscular stroma because your ultrasound segmentation picks this up as being part of the prostate. In summary, 3T multiparametric prostate MRI is a powerful modality for the detection of prostate malignancies. However, the anatomy of the prostate as well as the artifacts from MR imaging can mislead the reader into thinking a malignancy is present when it is not. Knowledge of the anatomy and the idiosyncrasies of multiparametric prostate MRI can improve a reader's accuracy. These are some of the references used in creating this talk. I'd like to say thank you for taking the time to review this session of the course. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel to continue to find updates and new course material. For additional material, please visit our website at interventionalurology.com. If you have any questions, please tweet at me at Dr. Rastenhead hashtag, and any comments, please hashtag MRFusion. Thank you so much for your time, and please stay tuned for more updates.